Welcome to the Sessa Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping Christian leaders navigate and lead through the cultural issues of our day. My name is Daniel Yang, National Director of Churches of Welcome at World Relief, and today we're talking to Tim Chaddick. Tim's an author, pastor, and church planner, and he began his first 10 years of church planning ministry as the lead pastor of Reality LA in 2006, a thriving church in the heart of Hollywood, before planting Reality London in the UK in 2016. In 2021, Tim returned to California to take up the pastor for preaching role at Reality Ventura in Ventura, California. But first, let's go to Ed Stetzer, editor-in-chief of Outreach Magazine and the dean of the Talbot School of Theology. Well, it is good to be in a conversation today, and our guest today being here in California is is a nice one. I was I had uh, I have a radio show that I do every week. I had Kara Powell on the radio show this past week, and and uh, and I was mentioning the beautiful weather in California. And afterwards, she sort of you know pulled me aside as you may do on a on a, on a Zoom call, and she said, uh, you know, one of the first rules of being a Californian is you don't brag on how awesome the California weather is. And my <laughs> response was, well, what's the point of being here? But anyway, because I lived in Chicago for for seven years, so. So, Tim, not far from here at reality. Well, we're going to jump into all that. But but part of what I want to talk about today and focus on today is um, Tim, this unique cultural experience. You know, the, we're going to talk some about engaging California, much more secular culture, much more progressive culture, London, much more secular, much more progressive. And, and what is it and what does it look like to be mm-hmm. on mission in what's becoming an increasingly secular world? And so we we actually can look at the stats. Right. So. Every year, about 1% less Americans identifies as Christian. Uh, and a lot of them, that's uh, most of those people are nominal Christians who just stop using the label. Sure. But we can look to the future in some ways to the, the well, Canada's, you know, maybe 10 years ahead of us and, and uh, you know, maybe maybe 10 points ahead of us. And then the UK, uh, you know, maybe maybe 15 years, but maybe not. Things are also accelerating. But you have now in much of the English speaking Western world outside the United States where the minority of people actually identify as Christian. And if current trends continue, and that's what trends tend to do, that's why they're called trends. If current trends continue, in all likelihood, we're going to find ourselves in that similar environment as well. Some of you are. I, I was I was teaching uh, at, at, uh, at Wycliffe Hall at Oxford in December, and we were looking at stats in the uh, in the UK. I had in a guest in this class I teach every year at, at Wycliffe. And um, had a guest from the UK, and she made a really good observation. Rachel Jordan Wolf's her name. She said, "Yeah, so pretty much, if you want to look at Northern Ireland for the Amer- there were Americans in the class, I bring Talbot students, and we did we do a joint class with the Wycliffe students. Uh, it says that's what America's like, and I and I think I think she was right. But I said, but also when you look at other places, you want to look say, in Wales, whatever, uh, much more rural, but that may be more secular." Like the Northwest is. So the problem with talking about broad stats like American stats is they they don't they don't there's it's just so many different worlds and we're listening from some different worlds. But part of what our hope is today is to give you a glimpse of a likely future based on statistical trends and what that means for you. But Tim, we need you to tell some of your story first. Tell us about your background and how God called you to be a church planner and a pastor. Yeah, I was born and raised in the San Francisco Bay Area of California. Um, as many would know, it's um, a lot more progressive uh, than Southern California. Um, I like to say everyone there believes in science and crystals. <laughs> it's like this on the one side, deeply, you know, intelligent, rational on the other side, you know, like very, very spiritual. So that was kind of the the world in which I grew up, became a Christian around uh, 19, ended up moving to Southern California to go to Bible college. And that's around the time that I began to sense that God was calling me into ministry. Uh, Pastor Brian Broderson, who um, is at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa down in Orange County, um, he would come out and do these lectures and he turned me on to Martin Lloyd-Jones and he gave me preaching and preachers and I read it and I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And it was in one of the chapters in that book where Martin Lloyd-Jones riffs on Romans 10, how shall they hear without a preacher? And it was as if the spirit of God was like, you are called to preach. So then I had to figure out, well, what does that look like? And Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa offered me a job. I was able to intern, you know, get ordained. But during those years living in Orange County with my wife, I met a man named Britt Merrick who started Reality, which is um, uh, turned into a relational church planning network. He became a really close friend. And he said, do you want to plan a church? I said, yes. He said, where? I said, San Francisco. He said, what about LA? I said, I hate LA. He said, just pray. He kind of did the Jedi mind trade, like, just pray. I was like, man, I don't want to go to LA. 
but we prayed for eight months. We're like, oh my goodness, we think God's calling us to LA. So 2005, we moved and prayed and prepared and eventually moved to Los Angeles and Hollywood to start Reality LA. So that's kind of the short version. There's a lot in there, but uh, I'm very thankful for that. For that yeah, I just journey. want to know, do you have an online streaming ministry there that comes out of reality churches? Uh, each reality church is a little bit different in what yeah, they no, offer was, in I terms of... I was actually of, working up to so a joke that... that yeah, so yeah, is yeah. that, do you call that virtual reality? Virtual just, reality, sorry, someone, yeah. I'm reality, sure, you, you, the jokes are endless. Yeah, I'm sure nobody has Lots thought of about that joke until yeah. this. The reality very, is, and everyone yeah. in the church is like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, one of the things too, one of the reasons I want to have a conversation with you today, and by the way, there's several books he's written I'm going to mention as well. We'll put those in the show notes. So you plant a church in Hollywood. Which, which is interesting to people because my, my daughter, uh, I have three daughters and I take them on a trip when they turn 10 and one of them wanted to go see Hollywood and was not what she expected. So I want to talk a little bit about that. But um, you, you plant a church in the heart of Hollywood and then a church in London. Um, I mean, again, more sec- now it's not Northern California. I mean, we both, Bay Area is going to be even more secular mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and, and more aggressively so. Maybe even more so. I mean, it'd be interesting to see to compare that to London today with the recent stats coming out of London with the immigrant churches. That'd be an interesting mm-hmm. contrast today. Uh, but what did you see as different between those two? Yeah, I think one of the, you know, there's a lot of similarities um, between places like LA, SF, and London, a lot of them around identity issues, um, work ambition, you know, you're going to find a lot of those similar, just very city like things in New York, you know, they're all going to have that, but you can't escape the cultural differences, you know, being from not just the United States, but California in particular, radical individualism is like the water in which you swim, you know, like when I was pastoring in LA, like the way that everyone viewed their lives was it's my story and LA is the backdrop to the story of me. You know, that's just how everyone understood it. It's like, I am my brand. I am my, you know, everything. But then in London, there's much more of a, of an emphasis on the collective, you know, it's putting the group first. Like I want to work for a a company. I want to work for a business and climb my way up in that. But there's very much a group mentality. America's very positive. Like you can do anything. But I was once told when we first moved to London by a cab driver who turned out lived in America for a little while, but he said, let me tell you the difference between Americans and the British. He said, in America, they tell you what you can do. And in England, they tell you what you can't do. Oh, interesting. <laughs> I was like, I can okay. see that though, but yeah, yeah. Makes yeah, sense. There's th- yeah, th- very, very much attention to the process and the collective. Even my daughters, I have three daughters. They, they all went to school there. So the differences there were so stark. So how, how that works out in church and you're preaching, like it, it really does. It makes an impact. But yeah, there's a lot of differences. Those are the ones that stand out. Yeah. Hey, Tim, you know, I'm, you've, you've been in San Francisco, L.A., London. Uh, curious in terms of like your church planting lessons and maybe mm. less so about being a church planter, but the lessons that you learn in terms of missional engagement how to interact with people that, you know, come from a secular background, you know, share with our listeners, like what, what are some of those lessons? Yeah. I think one of them is that, and this is so obvious, but I think often take for granted is there's no substitute for relationships. So often the conversation about how to engage the culture can be very academic. And of course, when I moved to London, you know, I'm like reading, you know, the spiritual history of London and, you know, British culture in the modern day, you know, all this stuff, which is, which is helpful, but there's no substitute for what it's actually like to meet your neighbors, to meet the parents um, who are dropping their kids off at, at school. And this was true in Hollywood. It was true in London because there you actually see how the culture plays out. Uh, One of my favorite definitions of culture is the way things are done around here. And when you live somewhere and you just interact with your neighbors, like that would really inform how I would preach, how I would plan, how I would, you know, prepare. And it really was helpful, especially given that we take a lot of things for granted, you know? So yes, I love reading the books, but one of the lessons is do not take, you know, your relationships for granted. They absolutely influence like the way that you can do ministry. But man, the other thing is just, the desperation of prayer. When we first made the decision to move to LA back in 2005, 
I was ready to move with my family and Britt Merrick, who was pastor of the church that was going to support us. He said, no, I want you to move to the city of Carpinteria before you move to LA. And I said, I hate Carpinteria. Why would I do that? I'm not like a beach guy. And he said, cause we're going to pray for a year because we can't attempt to accomplish anything for the kingdom of God, unless it starts with prayer. And that just, you know, put a stake in the ground. Like we are going to make prayer a priority in this church planning process. And I can't tell you how much that's shaped, like the culture of our churches. And then when we moved to London, we ended up bringing 150 people from California before we planted just to pray, to go throughout London for an entire week plus just to pray, hold prayer meetings every week, you know, like, man, desperation and prayer, there's no substitute for that. So I think not taking for granted the relationship building as a part of the incarnational missional process, of course, and just the priority of prayer. Don't just talk about it, like get on your knees and cry out to God for wisdom and direction, because you might hear, see an open door, you know, whether it's trying to find a, a venue in a certain neighborhood, like which neighborhood of, of London should we, should we plant and all those things. You can be informed by the books that you read, but you've got to pray and just allow the spirit of God. Um, to lead you. Those are two that really stand out for me. Yeah. Relationship and prayer. I want to come back to something that you said earlier about uh, how ad identity is shaped. Um, from your perspective and your experience in secular spaces, what do you feel like is are the primary shaping factors that a person who, especially if they grew up generationally, like not Christian, what do you think are the, the shaping factors for that person's identity? Yeah, I think I think it really depends on their cultural background. Ed, you mentioned um, the fact that the nations are represented, obviously in places like LA, but even more so in a place like London. So there is a huge difference in the people that you you meet depending on their story. You know, our, our church in, in London, I mean, we have people from Nigeria, Ghana, Ethiopia, you know, Eastern Europe, you know, they're all over the place. So how they engage and where they're at is very much shaped by their, you know, by their history. And so for them, how they view their identity in large ways is shaped by their, by their family. Whereas, you know, other people there, it's so much more about their creativity. It's about their work. Like LA was definitely one of the most, you know, individualistic places I think I've ever lived. Um, one of my favorite quotes was this street artist in L.A. who, upon hearing that L.A. was always referred to as superficial, uh, he was doing an interview and he said, you know, everyone says that Angelinos are superficial, but what they don't realize is we are deeply superficial. <laughs> and I thought that's the most L.A. thing ever. It's very much about identity is about your career. Identity is about your creativity. Uh, identity is about sexuality. I found that to be slightly less so uh, when we moved to London. You know, there was very much like, what tribe are you a part of? What community are you a, a part of? So it's important to notice those two things. But that was that would be a big difference between a place like LA and a place like London. Yeah, I can see the. I mean, one of the things I was I, when I'm when I'm in the UK, I typically preach at Kensington Temple, and KT. it is. I mean, it's in. It's in. I mean, a famous, you know, Notting Hill and all that sort of stuff. But it's it's um. I mean, it's, I'd say it's predominantly African or Caribbean yeah. Islander is yeah. most of the church. And so, and, and of course that's at a different place in the secularism scale. And so many churches are reaching these diverse nations. And I, I, I love, I love a multi-ethnic church. I think if you don't love a multi-ethnic church, you're really going to hate heaven. Um, <laughs> You, the the but in many places the the most secular places could be even outside could be you know in the in the in the countryside in in the UK in the villages and more, um, and it's so different in different places. Mm -hmm. But some commonalities among secular people is just sort of over religion. They're sort of you know we we talk about here the nuns, none of the above, and then yeah. the duns. I was and and then you know and then I'm then I'm not, and then or then the other one was recently talking about the hmm you know so well yeah I'm a Christian I don't really go. So, I mean, for the UK, it's in some ways you're generationally nuns, none of the above, which yeah. is a very important distinction between the two, that, that people my age 
are a lot of times one generation away from a faith commitment that their parents had. Or in the UK, it might be two or three. In California, and of course, you know, Hollywood, California is so transient. It's so yes. uh, it's so different in that sense. But still, many people have rejected the faith of their parents. So when you begin to seek to engage secular people, um, talk to us a little bit about that process. I just wrote, and I want to encourage people to, to get the next, the issue of uh, Outreach Magazine. We're focusing on church multiplication. I just wrote my editor's column for it this morning. And and I talked about just how secular spaces are going to require different strategies for church mm-hmm. planting. So talk to us about evangelism and church planting, how you engage secular people in those contexts. And maybe there are contrasts and maybe there are similarities between California, between Hollywood and London. Yeah. In LA, w- one of the opportunities that worked really well for us was um, putting on a lot of events where we were trying to bring the gospel to bear on the entertainment industry or, you know, nothing like slick or anything like that. But, you know, if we had a, a, a director or a producer or a writer who is a Christian, we would kind of put on an event like, you know, what does the story of Christianity have to do with how we tell stories? And we would just get a lot of you know, non-Christians who are genuinely like curious about that. Like, oh, how does, I didn't know that Christians even engaged with this. So it was a little disarming for them. And that became um, a regular rhythm for us that was hugely evangelistic. Like a lot of non-Christians, you know, would would come to things like that. Um, we can't underestimate the power of mercy ministry as providing opportunities, you know, for conversations with very secular people who, especially in places like LA, very cynical about the church. You're all hypocrites. You all don't practice what you preach. And then as they see the church like sacrificially serving, it's very compelling for them. They're like, well, what is it about this? In London, it was slightly different in that, Ed, you were kind of referring to this, but there's a, obviously having a state church, the Church of England, when I first moved to London uh, at the end of 2015, I worked for an Anglican church for about 10 months before we planted Reality Church London. And I remember uh, I opened my bank account and I I went to cash my first check and I go up to the teller and he sees Church of England on the check. And I think he just, he blurted out like an expletive. And I was like, oh, you don't like the church. And for him, he said, the church is the man. You know, they, they view it very much as like the establishment and he was kind of pushing against it. Whereas people f- who were maybe, you know, second generation in London, their their parents had moved over from another country and they were raised there. They don't have that same experience with the establishment. They don't have that same experience with the institutional church. So we found that a lot of people that were coming to Reality Church London, they didn't have that kind of uh, institutional experience, at least not in, in England. So we didn't find that we had to do as many apologetics you know, for the church, we just kind of had to tell the story. Like the simplest evangelistic outreaches are like, who am I? Why am I here? You could use things like alpha or Christianity explored. And like, people would just come, like it wasn't as hard. Whereas in LA, I, I found that we had to do a lot of deconstructing of wrong concepts of church and religiosity. It felt a lot more defensive. Whereas in London, it seemed like in some ways, a lot more open. And you referenced, um, I don't know as many statistics as you, but the one that always is in my mind when I think of the difference between America and the UK is peak church attendance, I believe was around 1950 in the US, but it was 1850 in the UK. So what America, yeah, what Americans are experiencing now, the loss of power and prestige in the public square, all my British friends are like, oh yeah, we, you know, that happened ages ago. But now we're on the other side of it and see, hey, the church has survived. Just keep on sowing the seed. Keep on being faithful. Don't get discouraged about what looks like the withdrawal from of the church. Just continue to operate from the margin and you will see you will see fruit. I want to ask you a question about preaching. I mean, your role right now at um, Reality Venture is pastor of preaching and think about in terms of how you prepare. But um, when you're preparing a sermon, how do you do it in a way where you're thinking about the secular person in mind? And then mind you, the secular person who could be sitting in the room with you the day of when you're preaching, but also primarily the secular people that aren't ever probably going to come into the room, but you're also preaching to a group of people that eventually you want to mobilize to engage them. So 
what's your thought process? What's your preparation process? And how do you incorporate those ideas into your actual message? Yeah, such a great question. There's three things that stand out for me when I'm preparing to engage with like secular people. One, it really, I, I do pay attention to content. I think, you know, anyone who's preaching and teaching, you want to be aware of whether it's podcasts or the books you're reading. Um, I just got done uh, reading Glenn Scrivener's The Air We Breathe, you know, where he's basically saying that even secular society's most cherished beliefs really come from Christianity, whether they realize it or not. So just really great books like that are always stimulating me. So that's obviously going to, you know, factor into how I'm preparing my sermon. But two, and this is probably just me, but I love to study, not all the time, but a lot of the time in coffee shops. So whether it was in LA or in people I used to make fun you, of me. You're just such a church planner, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Well, there's so many, there's so many reasons why I no, would but it's recommend. Great I agree. Yeah, you got to get around. You got to get to know the city because as I'm studying in a coffee shop, I'm overhearing all of these conversations. And as I'm literally, you know, making an application on a point, I'm overhearing how these people are talking about war or politics or their neighborhood or a tragedy or the things they're excited about. And it absolutely, you know, I get energized by that. I'm like, Ooh, the gospel is so relevant to that. Like, Oh, I'm just listening to all these conversations. And so in LA and London, I would make it a point every week. I'd go to a different coffee shop around the city, like a different neighborhood, a different demographic, just, just kind of for the fun of it, but also because it would stimulate me. But the, the third is I, I would try out my sermon on my secular neighbors. Oh, interesting. Always. You know, I, especially where we lived in London, um, it's this great neighborhood. And there's this tradition where all the parents, you know, what they walk their kids to the school gate and you talk about English football. Um, you know, you talk about go whatever's Liverpool. going on in the neighbor. Oh, go Arsenal football club. Um, <laughs> so you talk about these things and, you know, they would just maybe ask a question about, you know, what do you, you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I would kind of say, Hey, can I just, they would call me the vicar. They call me the priest, you know? Um, I'd say, hey, can I just, you know, I'm talking about this thing on Sunday. Can I just try it out on you? Can I let you know what I'm going to talk about? I I'd love to hear your thoughts. And and I would just kind of tell them what I'm studying about. Oh, this week I'm talking about identity. Where do you get your identity? And just having a conversation with someone I actually know and being able to engage with them and kind of get feedback. And oftentimes that would even lead them coming to church. Like, oh, I want to hear what you have to say on that. So for me, I love studying content, you know, good books, great podcasts. I love studying coffee shops, overhearing just the buzz of conversation, and then just investing in and hearing from my secular neighbors. Like, what do you honestly think about this? This is a safe place. I'm not going to quote you in the sermon, right? But what do you think that. about this? Yeah, I, <laughs> I've had made it, especially as my kids have gotten older, you know, you, yeah. you realize that you can't just share people's stories without permission, as I've learned from my oldest daughter. So. Yeah. Wow. That was, I'll give you a little trick, by the way, that will help you with this. If you say to them that if I accidentally do that, I will give you $20. First of all, they are actually fine with you occasionally throwing a story in there. And if you say, if you prearrange and negotiate $10 for, for permission stories. And so I, my kids are like, okay with it. I said, Hey, if I could do this. And anyway, it, it, it worked for a while, but I, I totally get it. I, my daughter gave me a hat for Christmas though, the, just this Christmas saying, uh, you know, warning, you know, uh, I'm a pastor stories may end up in my sermon. So, you know, you have to, you have to, have that there as well. Uh, let me mention too that, that Tim has some books out as well. Uh, Better is How Jesus Satisfies the Search for Meaning, which I think is really an important conversation in and around secular spaces, the truth about lies, the un unlikely role of temptation in who you will become. Um, and the truth about lies is, is uh, I mean, they both kind of point to some of the questions in and around that sort of reflect your your ministry. You're going to a place like Hollywood, which I think, well, we could pretty see, most people would see that's a place where, where lies are pretty common. I would say that lies are pretty common in, you know, in, in rural Arkansas too, but I'm just saying that there's, there is a sense that that resonates with people and their mind and their minds. What advice would you give to pastors and church leaders who maybe are finding that the people they engaged are, you know, Christians who, you know, like their church because it's got this or that, and they're kind of consumer minded or customers. And what advice would you give them to lean in and to engage secular people, not just to move Christians around? Yeah, I, I think it really does start at the relational level, like having a broken heart for your neighbors who are not Christian or they've never been to church and they don't have hope in, in their lives. I think a lot of times in 
church planning training, you know, there's this, uh, we can look at it and, and I've done this as well. You can look at it as just kind of this very broad, like, oh, we got to get this thing off the ground, got to reach critical mass, got to get the 150 mark, you know, and whatnot. And so to be honest, they're kind of happy if Christians just kind of shuffle, shuffle around. And I've, I've been guilty of that at, at times, but it's when God really breaks my heart as I like look out and I see these people don't know the truth. These people have not experienced the power of the gospel. Like, how can I build inroads for that? And the people that God, the Christians that God has brought into my life, whatever your core group, whatever you might want to call it, how can I mobilize them for mission rather than just trying to like fill seats? You know, I, I, I nobody's going to say my goal is to fill seats. Like nobody's going to say that, but oftentimes we function like that. Like, man, just keep that front, keep the mission front and center and don't just make it about these like benchmarks. I often tell church planners, like one of the lessons that I've learned is results may vary. <laughs> like be faithful, preach the word, live on mission. Results may vary. What happened, what I experienced in LA was very different than what I experienced in London. And that was okay because results may vary. It's not the same city. It's not the same thing. God did something very unique in LA and God was doing something different in London, my job is always to keep the mission just front and center so that if you experience fruit out of that, it's the kind of fruit that you want to see, like non-Christians, new people coming, like just equipping people for for mission, like keeping that absolutely front and center will kind of keep you away from just trying to like shuffle around Christians and not be preoccupied with all the questions that the shuffling Christians have, but focusing on the questions that unbelievers have and keeping that so that I always would tell my church, I would love it if every Sunday our congregants would think, Oh, I wish my friend was here. Oh, I wish my friend could have heard that. Like I'm always preaching in such a way that I hope that they would want to bring their neighbor and bring their relative and you know, bring their coworker. The next you mentioned week. that what happened in London and what happened in California. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what happened and uh, you know, kind of share a little bit about it. And, and I recognize too, that sometimes when, you know, people get a bit little anxious about sharing, you know, numbers, things of that sort, but I think it might help frame a little bit. So if you wouldn't mind, share a little bit about that. Yeah. And one of the reasons I love telling the story about LA is because it was, it was such a move of God because in the first year we planted reality LA, we probably had about 50 people or so. Um, and there was this young college student, he went to USC and he was, um, nearing graduation. He was so well-known and well-loved, like the most social guy. He would come to church faithfully every Sunday. He'd bring all of his friends, just drag all of his like USC friends or newly graduated working in the entertainment industry. He'd just bring all of his friends uh, to church. Sadly, he got into a, an accident, cracked open a skull. He went into a coma for about three months or so, and then he died. Hmm. But during that time that he was in the hospital, you know, we comforted his family, but all of his friends started coming to church. Like week after week, all his friends were starting to ask questions about life. They were like not Christians, or maybe they were raised with Christianity. They rejected it. They were genuinely concerned with, with their friend. They couldn't deny his like love and witness. And at his memorial, there was a thousand people that showed up to like honor his life. And during that time, all these young students, it was like, we went from like 60 to a hundred to 150 to 200 to 250 people. My sermons were mediocre. And yet all these young people after the sermon, during a time of worship and response would just come up to the front and like crying and like going and receiving prayer. And I remember thinking like, this is not normal. Like this is incredible. And for a number of years, it just kind of kept going. People just were bringing their their friends, but that's how it started. It wasn't because the music was great. I'm not saying that we shouldn't care about that. It wasn't because the sermons are great because they weren't. My father-in-law told me so. Oh, <laughs> I have proof, but it was Christ was being preached and the witness that they had seen in their friend compelled them to just want to, to come to church. And yeah, for a number of years, it just continued to grow. And at that time, as far as English speaking churches in central Hollywood, there wasn't too much happening at that point in time. So yeah, just, it, it really grew. Um, London was, was different and we had no expectations in, in going there. We knew there's a lot of work being done across London. We knew that the strategy was going to have to be 
very different. You know, are, are you going to be a C of E church, you know, or are you going to be outside of the Anglican church? You know, there's all these different things. Obviously it's a city over twice the size and more neighborhood centric, you know, just a lot of different challenges. And London was more the experience of just the slow, faithful plotting of just sharing the gospel with your neighbor, trying to figure out the best ways to provide an opportunity for them to ask their questions about faith um, and just slow and steady, you know, so two different stories, yeah. results may vary, but man, just trust in the spirit of God to move and don't try to manufacture anything. It's like one of the biggest mm. lessons I learned. We're not going to try to recreate what happened in LA. That was so supernatural and such a move of God. Like you can't put that in a church planting manual, you know, mm. a young person of faith like dies and their testimony is powerful. And many people, you can't, that, that's not a thing you can do. It's just incredible. You know, Tim, as we wrap up here, um, I, I was just thinking about how, you know, not only do uh, the secularism change from geography to geography, but also from generation and generation. Yeah. And there's a version of secularism that probably the three of us experienced that maybe feel slightly different for Gen Zers and even those coming behind them. Help church leaders understand as we wrap up here, like, what do you think is unique as we think about the next 20 years about secularism, like specifically in the American context? What are some issues to look for? What are some conversations to start now to get us ahead in terms of sharing the gospel with the next generation? I think we were all preparing for what we dubbed the post-truth culture. You know, I remember like preaching kind of, you know, 2000s, around 2010, 2011. We were all kind of preparing for this postmodern. All truth is going to be relative. And surprisingly, as we've all discovered in the last five years, I don't think we're in a post-truth culture, but we are in a post-trust culture. So if anything, people are doubling down on their sense of, of justice. And, you know, we, we've all kind of seen that. But what I have noticed and what I do think we need to prepare for is there is this post-trust culture where there's a suspicion of institutions. Um, obviously, we see that in politics, but particularly in the church. So a lot of the the younger people that I that I meet, they're genuinely, they're not asking the questions I thought they were going to be asking 10 years ago about like, what is real? What is true? But how can I trust you? What's going on at this church? Because I read the new, I hear about scandals. I see what's happening in the, you know, in the political square. Like, I'm just very suspicious of organizations, you know, in, in general. So I think it's, it's speaking to to those issues, like the trust issues, like where has the church lost credibility? What is just kind of a, a narrative that they see in the news? What are real issues you can actually deal with? How can you actually, you know, build trust with them through the way that you lead the church and the transparency and the humility and all that kind of stuff? Like, as we know, I was just at a conference, you know, for like a Gen Z conference, obviously not as a Gen Z person. Um, but just seeing how hungry they were for Christ, given all the craziness and chaos that's going on, but still with a lot of questions about like the church as what John Stott called an organized organism. <laughs> like, what about the institution? How, how does this, how does this work? So I think that's one helpful thing for us to reflect on as leaders and as church planners is it's not so much a post truth culture, but it is a post trust culture. So how can we speak to that issue because even when there is hypocrisy in the church jesus is the fiercest critic i think it was john dixon who said hey don't blame the you know the composition of a piece of music on the performance of the person who's you know playing that we may often the church may often perform bach if you will badly but that doesn't make bach's composition bad we need to draw people's attention back to christ even if the performance of the church often falls very short. Let's like keep pushing it back to what Christ said about himself and about the church. Let's focus on that to build trust. We've been talking to Tim Chaddock. You can learn more about Tim at timchaddock.com. And thanks again for listening to the Sets of Church Leaders podcast. You can find more interviews as well as other great content for ministry leaders at churchleaders.com slash podcast. And again, if you found our conversation today helpful, we'd love for you to take a few moments to leave us a review. That'll help other ministry leaders find us and benefit from our content. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.